You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner in English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, volume number 165, by Rudolf Steiner, of his Collected Works, entitled Unifying Humanity Spiritually Through the Christ Impulse. Translated by Christian von Arnhem, 13 lectures. This is Lecture 12, given in Dornach on the 15th of January, 1916. Tomorrow I would like to return to the spirituality of the early periods of Christianity and sketch out in a few strokes its continuing effect. On that basis, we will then be able to deepen what arose in the public lectures of the last few days. Today I want to give a kind of philosophical introduction to that to familiarize you with some of the historical aspects because it is a good thing if, within the movement of spiritual science, we know something about how others in the world are striving to approach the riddles of the world, what the thoughts and feelings are in respect of these riddles of the world. When we look at the textbooks about the history of philosophy up to the present day, we basically only ever find certain philosophical streams discussed, philosophical streams which are the popular ones, among most current philosophers. But we would be completely wrong if we considered what we normally find to be the only philosophical research in the present time. So, for example, most of you will know that in the course of the 19th century, particularly in the second half of the 19th century, and very particularly toward the end of the 19th century, up to our day, There was an active philosophical life within the Catholic Church, that within the Catholic Church scholarly priests fostered, and many still foster, a very specific philosophical direction, diverging from the rest of philosophy in the world. Hence there is a wealth of literature in this field, or at least as much of a literature as there is for other directions of philosophical activity. And this literature is termed the literature of neo-scholasticism. It was due to a peculiar circumstance that the school which flowered in the high Middle Ages, which basically started with Scotus Origina and then lived via Thomas Aquinas into the time of Duns Scotus, reappeared in the 19th century, even if out of a very specific desire for knowledge tinged with faith. We see this direction of neo-scholasticism appear in Catholic circles, particularly in the second, third of the 19th century. Book upon book is written in all Central and Western European languages in an effort to understand what lived in scholasticism. And when we try and investigate the inner reason why scholasticism was revived, we actually have to take a wider look. And that is what we will discuss a little today. I repeatedly emphasized in the lectures I gave in recent days that the path to spiritual scientific knowledge consists of a very special treatment of the thinking, the concepts of logic, that people under the influence of the exercises which lead to the development of such thinking manage to think no longer with their physical body, but with their etheric body. As a result, they do not think just with the dead logic of concepts, but live where the thinking is activated. That is, they live in the movement of their etheric body, as we call it technically. It is an entry into the life of the etheric body in which logic itself comes to life, in which, as I described it in popular terms, the statue which we can use as an image for the logic at work in ordinary life comes to life, in which human beings themselves come to life in their etheric body. That is, concepts are no longer dead concepts, but those living concepts arise of which I have said for years that the concept takes on life 
as if, it, as if we were in something that is alive with our soul. This living entity, which is the truth of concepts and ideas, has basically been lost to humanity in external philosophy for many centuries. I tried to point to this fact in the first chapter of my title, Riddles of Philosophy, which I added to the new edition. Even toward the end of the philosophical periods of Greek culture, humanity actually no longer knew anything about the possible aliveness of concepts and ideas in philosophical terms. Bear that in mind. To begin with, the Greeks, you can read about this in my Riddles of Philosophy, had concepts and ideas in the way that people today have sense impressions, a color, a tone, or a smell. The great Plato, up to Aristotle, and even more so the more ancient philosophers, did not believe that they had developed the concept, the thought inwardly, but that they came to them from things in the same way that we have red or blue, that is, the sensory impression, images coming in. Then the time came, I have described how this progresses in cycles, in which there was no longer an inner feeling that it was the things which gave one the concept, but people only felt that the concept arose in the soul. And then people did not know what they should do with the concept, the inner idea of which the Greeks still believed they came from things. That is how those scholastic problems arose, those scholastic riddles. What does the concept mean in relation to things, in the way that a color belongs to a thing? The Greeks could not ask such a question because in their consciousness it was the things which gave them the concepts. So the concepts belonged to the things, like a color belongs to a thing. That ceased as the Middle Ages arrived. There people had to ask, what is the relationship between something that arises in our spirit and the thing? And also, the things out there are multiple, manifold, and individual, but concepts are general, a unity. We go through the world and see many horses. From these many horses we form the uniform concept of horse. Every horse accords with the concept of horse. Today, many people, who know even less what we do with the concept than the medieval philosophers did, who saw it as an acute problem, say, well, it is simply that the concept is not in the things themselves. I have repeatedly referred to a comparison which my friend, the late Vincenz Knauer, who was very knowledgeable about medieval philosophy, often used for the people who say, it is only the material part of the animal which is out there. The concept is produced in the soul. Good old Knauer would always say, people say that the lamb is out there, but what is really there is only matter. The wolf is out there, but what is, re- what is really there is only matter. It is the soul which produces the concept of lamb and the concept of wolf. And good old Knauer would add, If it were really just matter, and the wolf were locked up and were given nothing but lambs to eat, then finally, once it had replaced its previous matter, it would only be lamb, because it only has the matter of lambs within it. But astonishingly, it remains a wolf, so something else has to be there apart from matter. A significant problem, a significant riddle, arose for medieval scholasticism at this point. The scholastics said to themselves, the concepts are the universals because they comprise many individual things. And they could not say, as people today like to say, that these universals were something that had arisen in the human, had only arisen in the human spirit, had nothing to do with things. These medieval philosophers distinguished between three types of universals. The first, they said, was the universal's ante rem, before the thing, before what we see out there. So the universal, in quotes, horse, is thought before all possible sensory horses, as a divine thought. 
That is what medieval scholasticism said. Then there is the universal in re, in the thing, in the sense of being the essence of things, the part which matters. The universal wolf, in quotes, is what matters, and the universal lamb is what matters. They are what stops the wolf turning into a lamb if it eats lots of lambs. And then there is a third form of universal, that is post-rem, after the thing, as it is in our spirit when we look at the world and have detached it from the thing. The medieval scholastics placed great value on these distinctions. This protected them from the kind of skepticism, the kind of quibbling, according to which we cannot get to the essence of things, because such skepticism considers the concepts and ideas which people obtain in the soul through things to be merely fabrications of the soul and does not imagine them to be anything which could be of relevance to the things themselves. A development of this skepticism can then be found in the one form of in Hume and in the other form in Kant. There, concept and idea have totally turned into something which the human spirit creates in the form of ideas. Human beings can no longer get to the things through concepts and ideas. A very particular difficulty now arose, and will always arise, for the theologians who also wanted to be philosophers, who wanted to penetrate theology with philosophy. Because theologians are obliged not just to see the things in the world, but to think of them in a certain relationship with the divine archetype. And they get into difficulties if they cannot themselves place the concepts and ideas which they obtain from the things and which form the content of the only knowledge of the spirit, unless we progress to spiritual science, into some relationship with God, that is, conceive of them as universals ante rem, as universal concepts before the thing. Now, there is something very important connected with what I have said. There will always be people who cannot see anything in the concept which is connected in some way with things, who simply see matter in the things out there. And on the other hand, there are those who see something real in the concepts which is connected with the things themselves, which is in things, and which the human spirit extracts from things again, which the human spirit turns from universals in re to universals post rem. Those who accept that concepts have a reality outside the human spirit were called realists in the Middle Ages and beyond, and particularly in Catholic philosophy. And the view that the concepts and ideas have a real meaning in the world is called realism. The other view, which assumes that concepts and ideas are only fabricated in the human spirit, as, it, as words, as it were, is called nominalism and its representatives are called nominalists. You can easily see that the nominalists can actually only perceive what is real in its manifoldness, its diversity. Only the realists can see something real in the all-encompassing, the universal. And that is where we reach the point where a particular difficulty arose for the theologians who were also philosophers these Catholic theologians had to defend the dogma of the Trinity, of Father, Son, and Spirit, the three persons in the divinity. In accordance with the development of church theology, they could only say, the three persons are individual, self-enclosed beings, but at the same time they must be a unity. If they were nominalists, the divinity would always be separated into three persons. Only the realists were still able to conceive of the three persons under one universal. But in order to do so, the universal concept had to have a reality. That required a realist. That is why the realists were better able to cope with the Trinity than the nominalists, who were in great difficulties, and who, finally, when scholasticism had already degenerated into skepticism, 
hid behind saying, we cannot understand how three persons are supposed to be one divinity. But that is precisely why we have to believe it, have to do without knowledge. Something like that can only be the subject of revelation. Human reason can only lead to nominalism, cannot lead to any kind of realism. And this is basically the teaching of human Kant, which, via the detour of phenomenalism, has become pure nominalism. The central dogma of the Trinity, the three divine persons, was therefore dependent in realism or nominalism on the one or other view of the nature of universals. You will therefore understand that there was a reaction in Catholic circles when Kant's philosophy increasingly became the philosophy of Protestant circles in Europe. And this reaction consisted of saying that the old scholasticism would have to be re-examined in detail to fathom precisely what the scholastics had meant. In short, the attempt was made because there was no new way to obtain an understanding of the spiritual world to reconstruct scholasticism. And a wealth of literature was created which solely set itself the task of making scholasticism accessible to people again. Of course, this literature only lived among the Catholic scholarly theologians, but among them it was widespread. And for those who are interested in everything which happens in the intellectual culture of humanity, it is certainly not without benefit to look a little into this comprehensive literature which made its appearance. It is useful occasionally to take a look into this neo-scholastic literature, if only because one can get an idea how black and white can live alongside one another in the world. Please, no pun intended. The whole way of thinking, the whole way of looking at the world is different in the advancing stream of philosophy, which picks up from Kant, Fichte, Hegel, or previously Descartes, Malbranche, Hume, to Mill and Spencer. That is quite different research into ideas. That is a quite different way of thinking about the world. Then comes to expression, for example, in Gratry and the numerous neo-scholastics who were writing everywhere, in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Belgium, in England, in Germany. For there was a wealth of scholastic literature in all countries. And all the orders of the Catholic priesthood participated in the discussion. The study of scholasticism became particularly active starting in 1879, because that is when the Eterni Patri encyclical of Pope Leo XIII appeared. This encyclical made the study of Thomas Aquinas virtually a duty for Catholic theologians. Since that time, a wealth of literature based on Thomism has arisen and the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas was studied and interpreted in detail. But the whole movement had already started earlier, so that we can fill libraries today with the many brilliant things that have been written in this renewal of Thomism. You can, for example, inform yourself in a book such as titled The Origin of the Human Reason, or from many a French book, or, if you prefer, from numerous works of the Italian Jesuits and Dominicans, about the brilliance with which philosophy was once again pursued. A lot of brilliance was used in all countries in the study of scholasticism, a brilliance about which the people, including those who are studying philosophy today, have no idea because they do not have the necessary interest to turn their attention to all aspects of human endeavor. The need had arisen from this side to respond to Kantianism, which had pulled the rug from under the feet of Catholic theology, in that it had turned into pure nominalism, particularly in the second half of the 19th century. I am speaking now in purely historical terms, not to place a value on anything, not even to refute or agree with anything, purely historically. Here, we can see that people in this area have basically endeavored to the present day to discover what the concept, the thinking, is about. People today cannot do anything at all with concepts in the old sense. They have to be given some life if people want to make some progress. 
Attempts will have to be made for a long time to obtain a theoretical understanding with a mere pictorial concept of the importance of thinking with regard to the divinity. Footnote, editor's note, there are gaps in the note taken by the stenographer here. The sentence should probably read, quote, attempts will have to be made for a long time to obtain a theoretical understanding, not just a mere pictorial concept of the importance of thinking for the comprehension of the divinity, end of footnote. Others tried in other ways. A very important movement arose, for example, which is even very close to Catholicism and has been promoted by Catholic priests, but which did not find the approval of the Catholic authorities to the same degree as scholasticism. It had been made a duty of Catholic theologians in the Eternae Patris Encyclical to renew the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, to resurrect it, Another direction, which was not viewed with such benevolence by the Catholic authorities, was the direction of Rosmini Serbati and Gio Berti. Rosmini, in particular, who was born in Rovereto near Trento and died in 1855 in nearby Stressa, brought his endeavors to expression, particularly in works which were not published until after his death. It is interesting how Rosmini wanted to make progress by investigating the real value of the concept. Rosmini realized that human beings have the concept present in their inner experience. Those who remain pure nominalists stop there, that they experience the concept internally and pass over the question where the concept exists in reality. But Rosmini was brilliant enough to realize even if something reveals itself inwardly in the soul, that does not mean that it only has reality inwardly in the soul. And so he knew by starting specifically from the concept of being that the soul, when it experiences concepts, at the same time also experiences the living inner being of things that lives in the concepts. And so Rosmini's philosophy consisted of a search for inner experiences that were experiences of concepts for him, but in doing so he did not fill them with life, but merely came to a diversity of concepts. And then he sought to specify how the concept can live simultaneously in the soul and in things. That was expressed with particular clarity in the posthumous work of Rosmini's called Theosophia, also, excuse me, others also took this view in Catholicism, but Rosmini was one of the most brilliant. Now, a direction such as Rosmini's is somewhat inconvenient for Catholic theology and causes it discomfort because it is difficult for this side to combine the concept of revelation with this theory of the concept. For the concept of revelation basically says that the highest truths must be revealed. They cannot be experienced inwardly in the soul, but must be revealed outwardly in the course of human history. Human beings can only approach reality with their concepts up to a certain degree, and beyond this sphere of the concepts there rises the sphere of revelations. That is the standpoint of the scholastics. That also coincides better with what Catholicism today sees as its nerve center than the concepts experienced in Rosmini's way. Because if we have experienced concepts, then it is actually God who lives in us. And Catholic theology basically has a dread of that when people claim that God lives in human beings. That is also the reason why Pope Leo XIII decreed in the 1880s that Rosmini's theory was heresy and prohibited Catholic theologians from studying and teaching Rosmini's philosophy without permission from their superior authorities. Because that is how they do things among the Catholic theologians. I don't know whether that is absolutely complied with. Let me read that again. I don't know whether that is absolutely complied with. In any event, the publications of Catholic theologians from all camps carry the seal of the superior Episcopal authorities. 
That means that Catholic theologians are allowed to study such a work. There are certain exceptions for those who are university teachers, but things are handled very strictly, at least in theory. So we can see here, too, an attempt to work one's way through to an understanding of the role of thinking in the world. I would like to interpolate something of a quite different nature here. Such interpolations are sometimes necessary. Many of our friends believe they are doing something particularly good for our movement when they tell Catholic theologians, for example, that we are not anti-Christian at all and that we are seeking an honest concept of Christ. And in their credulity, our friends go so far as to tell one or another Catholic theologian about the way we characterize Christianity. Because our friends then believe in their, excuse me, naivete, that they can convince these theologians that we are good Christians. But as Catholic theologians, they can never admit that. My dear friends, they will be much happier with us if we do not seek Christ, if we do not concern ourselves with Christ. Because it is not a matter, we always have to be aware of that, of someone having this or another concept of Christ, but it is a matter of the rule of the Church. And particularly if there was a good or better concept of Christ outside the Church, that would be combated to the greatest possible extent. So, those of our friends do us the most damage in their credulity, who go to Catholic theologians and want to convince them that we are not anti-Christian, because they will say, it is very bad if a concept of Christ can establish itself outside the Church. We have to judge the things in life in accordance with the circumstances of life and not in accordance with naive opinions. We will be particularly severely attacked if the theologians should discover that we somehow understand something about the inner existence of Christianity which could make a convincing impression on a larger number of people. So we can see that it has become necessary to obtain a deeper understanding of the concept and its relationship with reality. And there we do have to say among the most brilliant things that have happened in this direction at all in modern times is what is contained in the writings of Rosmini. He worked through it in all fields and it can be of particular value if we study Rosmini's concepts of beauty, the aesthetic concepts. Rosmini's aesthetics is something particularly valuable, which we should study to see how a modern intellect works its way up until he stands before the gates of spiritual science, but is unable to enter. That can be studied exceptionally well in Rosmini. Thus we will find that there really are spiritual streams that want to work toward an understanding of the concept, but do not get as far as to see that we now live in the time in which the concept must be filled with life if we want to enter reality. So the concept has a certain history behind it. I discuss this history in part of my book titled Riddles of Philosophy in the chapter I mention. But I still wanted to refer to something else here. We can say that the concept continues to develop. There was a time in which the concept was perceived like color and tone are perceived. This was the case with the Greeks. Plato is the last one to speak of concepts in such a real way that we can see that there is still some understanding in him of such an apprehension of the concept. It has already changed in Aristotle. Then we come to the Middle Ages where the concept is seen in purely rational terms and where people investigate its behavior as a universal and where the structure of anti-rem, in-re, post-rem is found as a bridge. Then the time comes in which the concept is conceived of in purely nominalist terms. That carries on into our time. But there is a reaction, the ancillary movements that seek the concept as an inner experience, like Rosmini does. From this point, see diagram Rosmini, we could come to the life or an experience of concepts. 
The concept would be chained to the physical body, as it were, in this time, see diagram before Plato to the Middle Ages, and now be transferred to the etheric body. The concept would lead to a clairvoyant experience of the concept. But here we would have to say that the concept as perceived at a very early stage, as well as the concept of the nominalists and realists, has developed from an atavistic clairvoyance. And now the way in which the concept is experienced has to be a conscious way, whereas in earlier times it was more subconscious. And indeed, if you go from Plato, from the Greek philosophers who had the concept as something they perceived, back to the remains of Zoroastrianism, then you have this atavistically understood, or perhaps we should not say atavistic because this expression has only obtained validity today, this dreamlike clairvoyant experience of the concept. And there's a chart. Thus the philosophies of Asia Minor presented the concept as something which they experienced pictorially. Persian philosophy sees a being in the, quote, horse in general, close quote, which takes specific, differentiated form in the individual horse, something still living. The Persians called that ferur. That becomes abstract and turns into platonic idea. The ferur of the Persians became the platonic idea. Ferrur is spelled F-E-R-U-E-R. End of readers aside. Abstraction increasingly gains ground because the thinking is only experienced in the physical body. We have to return to a conscious experience of the concept. You can see a wonderful cycle occurring in this field from the ancient clairvoyance of the concept through what the concept had to become in the age of physical experience the only rational concept, the only conceived concept, the only logical concept. I have often emphasized that logic first arose through Aristotle when the concept was no longer understood as anything but a concept. Previously, no logic was needed for the concept as an experience. And now logic comes to life. The statue of logic passes over to life. This one example of the concept illustrates once again what can otherwise be seen in general on a large scale. Thus we also have to study the whole course of human development in detail, because then we will gain an ever better understanding of the meaning which underlies the spiritual movement to which we belong. And we will become ever more objective through these things, something that is also necessary. Where would we be if the objective side were not understood and our dear friends were dragged ever more into what is personal. Working objectively, that must be our task, and the purely personal has to recede ever more into the background. The end of Lecture 12